Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ask the Expert, an award-winning daily series from 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. to help small businesses. If you have any questions at all today, please pop them in the comments of the live feed. If you need any more advice, join the official Intuit QuickBooks SMB community group on Facebook, where you've got accountants and business experts available on hand 24 hours a day. Now, during today's live session, there will be a poll running, so please do engage with that, and I'm excited to be able to reveal the results at the end. There is a date for your diary next week. On the 3rd of March, you can attend the Intuit QuickBooks virtual event, QuickBooks Connect. Uh, this is a virtual event that brings together entrepreneurs, small business owners, and accountants to grow, learn, and connect with each other. So definitely one for your diary there. So welcome to today's Ask the Expert. I'm Jenna and I have the pleasure of taking you through the next half an hour talking all things pitching our businesses virtually. Now my specialism is helping others to communicate with more confidence and impact. And that's really important and I mainly work with small business owners as well as entrepreneurs as a pitch coach. And it's my background in broadcast journalism where I say that I found my passion for public speaking and whenever I say that someone always says but Jenna there's no such thing as a passion for public speaking but I, I assure you that is true um, and my career since my journalism days has taken me on an incredible journey across a range of different industries really with this common thread of supporting others to communicate with confidence but really to find their voice and maximize it for both business and career success. And I always say that there's a powerful voice in everyone. And if you can unlock yours, you will absolutely reap the benefits from it. So today I run a coaching and training business called the I Am Hub with that very goal in mind to help you communicate with more confidence and impact. And I've got some quick wins that I want to take you through all around pitching your business virtually. So any questions that you've got on this topic, please do pop those into the comments and we'll come to as many as possible. Now, when I say pitch your business, often we might have images coming up of boardrooms of investors, Dragon's Den style stages, but more often than not, it might be sales meetings to secure new clients. Loads of different opportunities that we have. But in reality, every conversation we have with someone about our business is effectively a pitch in itself. It doesn't just need to be an end user, a direct customer or an investor that we're speaking to. Anyone we speak to about our business has, has the opportunity to recommend our services and it is almost that opportunity to pitch our business. But of course, over the last 12 months, and I can't believe we're going into March next week and it's nearly a year since lockdown part one, but for the best part of a year, those meeting rooms, boardrooms, stages have of course become our camera lenses and our laptops. And it is a big difference. And we've all had to adapt to that difference as well. It's just about having a bit of a different approach to really maximize our impact when we do pitch our businesses virtually as opposed to in person. So if I asked you to name the different types of pitches that you've done in your career so far, I imagine there's quite a few. Some you may not even associate with the term pitching your business. But on the one end of the scale, we've got the classic elevator pitch, that 30 second introduction that we often pull out when we meet new people. And we're asked that classic, super common question. So what do you do? And we're thinking, my goodness, I've got that 30 seconds to try to justify and really clearly articulate what it is that I do. On the other end of the scale, you've got the sort of longer, all singing, all dancing, slide deck shows, if you like, more often than not to investors, but still sort of quite lengthy on that end of the scale as well. But there's so many opportunities and everything in between those two opposite ends of the scale includes those conversations that we're having every day with people about our businesses. So there's so much that's different from in-person to online. And if you think about in-person meetings, like I've said, those conversations that is a pitch for our business, there's a lot of emphasis and opportunity for impact with our body language because people can see all of us. Back in the day, if we remember when we actually had to make an 
a, an impact or we had to make an effort with what we was wearing on our bottom half. My goodness, that seems like so long ago that we've done that. But we do have our body language to make an impact on. In person, we can also read the audience, read the room, engage with the audience a bit more, but that's so tough to do virtually. When we are online, our body language still makes a difference. Our facial expressions, for example, are a lot more important because we're reduced to our heads and shoulders, understandably, and this screen acts as a barrier between us and our audience. Our voices have so much more impact and are so much more important, especially if we're, we're speaking to slides or if we're doing a demo of our product online, for example. We want to get that energy and passion across in our voice as much as possible. And I use the analogy BTW when I talk about the pillars of presenting. Some of you might be thinking that stands for, by the way, uh, to an extent, that might be a good way to remember it, but in my context, it's body language, tone of voice and words. So do think about using your body language, how you're using your voice and things like eye contact when you're delivering your pitch. The 2020 classic challenge of looking at our camera lenses instead of the people below us on the screen, that little difference really does make a big impact. So first up, remember your delivery style. Think about BTW. The second analogy that I want to bring your attention to covers three classic errors that I've definitely noticed over the last year or so that really we need to change around to make more impact. And I've got my small whiteboard here to show you what that is, and that's PET. So P-E-T is the next analogy you want to remember. I love a whiteboard, by the way. Uh, if any of you follow me on LinkedIn will know that I do a weekly whiteboard series uh, with videos on communicating with confidence um, and impact. So some top tips. So literally any excuse to use this today, I was going to, to use it. I might bring it out again later. We'll see how we go. So getting back to PET, the P stands for preparation. <clears throat> and the common error here, excuse me, is the lack of preparation going into virtual meetings. So often, how many of us, me included, will jump from one meeting to another without much breathing space in between? We haven't got those train journeys, bus journeys, walking opportunities to get into that right frame of mind to think who are we speaking to and what's the aim of this meeting? So taking that time to get into the right mindset. The other area of preparation, of course, is the tech checks. Yes, we've been doing this for a year, but we don't want to get complacent. And I call these our SIV tests. S-I-V, sound, internet, video. I'm bombarding you with a lot of letters today, I know, but hopefully you remember these analogies. Just take a few minutes to check your sound, your internet video, because it will make a big difference and give you a bit more confidence that everything's working fine going into these pitching scenarios. The E in PET is to engage your audience. And the common error here is that we fail to engage our audience as we would in person. We do struggle to read our audience. And actually last week's whiteboard video that I did was on reading our audience online. It is really tough, but we want to be bringing our personality forward as much as possible. And I do see pitches as a bit of a performance. It doesn't mean we need to be inauthentic. It doesn't mean we need to show up as a different version of ourselves, but we have got that opportunity to bring our personality. And that's what's going to build that rapport with our audience, whether that's one person we're speaking to or a room full of people. And I always talk, when I work with entrepreneurs as, as well, the element of people buy into people as much as the product or service that we're selling or that we're developing really does ring true. So really show up on camera and be confident to bring your personality. And then finally, the T in PET is technology. The common error here is not maximizing the technology that we've got accessible uh, to us. So it's never too late to get a half decent camera, an external microphone, thinking about our lighting, because first impressions really do count. And the other side of tech prep is of course, getting comfortable with the technology that we're using, the platforms that we're going to be presenting on. We've all got our preferred platforms. For me, for example, Zoom is like my best friend, whereas my Teams, for example, was very much my enemy for quite a long time, but I learned to make it work for me. So I made sure that I could get comfortable with Teams because so many of my clients use that platform. So really try to get comfortable with the tech. Now, I've mentioned mindset there a couple of times, getting into the right mindset, going into these situations. And the reason why I say that is because that has such a huge part, it plays a huge part in coming into these pitch scenarios with confidence and impact as well. And I worked with a business owner recently, a small business owner who was preparing for a meeting with a prospective new client. 
And she was very much seeing this as a pitch, an opportunity to pitch her business which yes, absolutely it was, but the trouble was that she associated pitching with fear, anxiety, pressure, those ground swallow me up moments. So we really worked on reframing her approach to see it as more of a conversation about her business rather than this sort of formal pitch. And that term on itself can be quite overwhelming. So we need to try and change our mindset. So I encourage you to find out what works for you to change your mindset, to get into the approach of, I'm feeling confident and positive going into these situations. And that can be any opportunity to pitch your business. It could be virtual networking opportunities, meeting new people, formal presentations, informal meetings. What's gonna work for you to get into that right frame of mind? I feel like I could talk about this topic all day long, literally, but I do want to get to your questions um, as soon as possible. So just some tips there to start with. Um, and obviously I'll come uh, to your questions shortly, but think about those analogies, BTW, your body language, tone of voice, words, avoid those pets, turn it into a positive. So you are prepared, you are engaging your audience, you are maximizing your technology. And of course the uh, mindset point there as well. Okay. So let's go to your questions um, and keep those coming as much as possible. So Nadia from Instagram story has said, what things influence a person when speaking publicly? Wowza, what a great question. A quite a big question there as well. And if you take it from an approach of what things influence someone coming across compelling, quite credible, there can be so many different things. The mindset side, I would say is really key getting into the right mindset when we are speaking publicly, because sometimes nerves can get the better of us and we really want to channel those nerves to be more positive, to think I'm excited by this, I'm looking forward to this opportunity. So I'd say mindset is a big thing. Audience, when I work with different clients, different people have different, I guess, triggers of the number of people they're speaking to that might then make them think, oh, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable here. So they might say, okay, up to 10 people, I'm fine. Beyond that, I feel a bit nervous. But that's where your mindset comes in as well. So I'd say that's the biggest thing that influences a person when speaking publicly and also having the knowledge of what you're talking about. But hopefully that's a key point uh, that you can take away there. Okay, Kalani from Twitter DM. Um, Hi, Jenna, I'm planning to coach my team with public speaking and I'm wondering if there are any activities that we can do in a team scenario. Love that. Uh, so group public speaking training is great. And it's the first thing to do is that we want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable in that setting because you'll have some people that feel more confident with public speaking. Others, it might be a real fear for them as well. So you want to gauge the consensus of the team as well. How are people feeling about this opportunity? Because you don't want to put anyone in, in too of an awkward situation or an uncomfortable situation. Uh, but in terms of activities that you can do in a team scenario, I love the idea of being able to work in pairs. So you're, yes, you're in a group, but break people off into pairs, get them to talk about something that they're really comfortable speaking about. This is something that I do in my team trainings as well. So you'll break off into pairs, encourage them to speak about, it could be anything, a sport, a TV series they're watching, you know, what they've been doing over the last week or so, something they can talk quite comfortably about for about a minute and get them to focus, not necessarily on what they're saying, and that's why you want that to be an easy topic to talk about, but really put an emphasis on how they're presenting it. So body language, eye contact. If it's online, that's what you want to be working about. How are they delivering their message versus what they're saying? So I love that paired off breakout activity and then get everyone to come together to feedback. What did they notice? What worked? What didn't? What could be improved? What did someone do that was really impactful and engaging? So I think I'm hoping uh, that's an idea for you there as well. Uh, Lenora from Instagram DM. Good morning, Jenna. Any tips on how to close the pitch on a high note? Love this question. I always talk about the plane analogy when I talk about pitching and often actually any presentation. So you really want to know where you're taking off and you want to know where you're landing. And the reason why is because people's attention is often at the start of your presentation and at the end of your presentation. It's not to say that everyone's going to drift off in between, but those are where people are going to be really captured. And if we can start really strongly, then hopefully we've captured them for the whole pitch and presentation and then we want to end on a high. So closing, I, funnily enough, I did a video on closing presentations uh, a few weeks back um, and I had a little, I think I used, it was a name that I used um, to, to bring it to life. 
one thing I would say to start with is make sure you absolutely know where you're, where you're closing your presentation. What's that final sentence? More often than not, it will be some sort of call to action. And that's what's gonna be quite powerful because you want the audience to act on whatever it is that you're talking about, or at least you want that point to be lingering in their minds after your presentation. So have some sort of call to action. If it's a pitch, I work with a lot of startups to really make sure they know obviously who's going to be in the room and tailor the call to action for them. But even if it's just a call to action to join us on our journey to ABC, whatever the problem they're solving is. So really make sure you've got a clear call to action. That's what I'd say is, is key. You might want to end with food for thought. You know, Think about how much, da, 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 da. it might be a fact that you want to bring in. There's different ways. I'd encourage you to check out the videos on my YouTube channel on closing presentations. But those are the key things. Make sure you know the sentence that you're going to close on so you don't drift off a little bit. It's so easy for us to go off into a tangent and think no one's really said anything at the end of my presentation, but hold that silence. But have a call to action and just make sure that that, it, that thought is lingering for them as well. Okay, Hiroshi from Facebook Messenger. When we used to do pitches in person, it was easy to get the vibe of everyone in the room. Yes, absolutely. Is there any way to do that for virtual meetings? Ah, oh, Hiroshi, the, this is like the golden question. Um, and as I mentioned, my whiteboard video last week was on reading our audience. The first thing to say is that this is very tough. It is difficult because we haven't got that atmosphere that we can pick up on. What you can try and do in terms of pitches, it depends on what platform that you're using. If you can see the people on the screen when you're doing your pitch, don't let that put you off if they're looking down, if they don't look like they're giving you much eye contact. Try not to let, try not to overthink it. Try not to read too much into body language of other people on the screen if you can see them. The reason why I say that is because often we can try and overthink what are they thinking? They're looking down They're They're not, you know, they look like they're typing away on another screen. They try to think of the positive there. Maybe they are taking in what you're saying. They're making some notes and they are genuinely engaged with you. So always think of the positive. The other thing, I mean, when I look at presentations, I suppose more than more than pitches is if you've got the opportunity to engage with them on the chat, have a bit of small talk beforehand, just so everyone feels a bit more relaxed as well. But biggest piece of advice there is don't overthink it um, and do trust yourself. You, you need to have that self-belief that I've got this, I know my pitch, I know what I'm talking about and I'm gonna give this everything. Don't let any sort of overthinking of who's on the screen, what might they be thinking of me, get in the way of that really go in it all guns blazing that you've practiced this you know your stuff and you can go in there as well so hopefully that helps a little bit again check out that video um, in terms of other other pointers of, of reading your audience but the main takeaways from that video is that it is tough you're not necessarily going to accurately read everyone in the room because anything that people do if they've got their videos off that's another thing that might put you off that oh, if they've not got their video on they're not engaged they're not listening there are so many reasons why people won't have their videos on. Some, you know, I guess more, more, more than others, maybe they've, you know, got kids, for example, they don't know what's going to come flying into the background behind them, their internet connection, they might want to be really maximizing. So they're turning their videos off. It could be anything. So again, don't read too much into what you're seeing or not seeing on the screen. Hopefully that helps for you, but great question. Uh, William from Instagram story. Do you still get nervous? If so, how do you calm yourself? Absolutely. Anyone that says that they don't get nervous when they speak publicly, I just, I, I question um, how, how true that is. Even if it's just a few little butterflies uh, in your stomach, because nerves show that you care. And as much as I, I, I love public speaking and I feel like I do go into situations with confidence because I enjoy it, I still get those nerves. But for me to calm myself down is thinking of what do I want my audience to get out of this presentation? And I, I put the, the focus of attention more on the value I'm bringing to my audience rather than making it all about me. Because when we make it all about us, that's when we get into our heads sometimes. We, again, going back to the point I was making with reading our audience, we overthink what other people are thinking. And then before we know it, we've almost gone on this spiral um, of thoughts that we just don't, that aren't going to really maximize us and, and help us out. So yes, absolutely nerves are still there. Try to put the focus of attention on what do I want my audience to come away with, with this presentation? If it's a pitch, what value am I bringing to my presentation? 
whenever we watch other people speak, think about how we feel watching them. We want to feel relaxed. We want to feel quite calm and we want to feel comfortable in that space. So really know that your audience is backing you and they're behind you in every situation that you're speaking because they want to feel relaxed. And to do that, the speaker needs to be relaxed as well. Uh, other really practical things, take some really deep breaths just so you're, you're calming yourself down. Make sure you've got some sips of water uh, so you can have those as well. And also find what works for you to get into that mindset, that word I used earlier. What works for you to get into the right mindset? Is it listening to certain types of music? Is it going for a run beforehand? Is it doing some yoga, some meditation? Everyone's going to be different, but that will help calm your nerves as well. And just try to really attack these opportunities with positive uh, mindset rather than thinking of what's the worst that's going to happen. So William, hopefully uh, that gives you some tips um, on that as well. Um, Kaya from Facebook Messenger, hopefully I've pronounced your name uh, correctly there. Uh, I just went freelance, congratulations, amazing. Um, and got my first client last week. Oh my goodness, awesome, another congratulations. Uh, when they buy my service, they also have to buy into me as a person, absolutely. And I'm a bit of an introvert. Do you have any advice? Really great question, um, Kaya. And, and one thing to say that not all speakers who come across confident, who present and pitch confidently are extroverts. And I've, I've spoken to a lot of clients and worked with a lot of people who do say that they're an introvert. But again, it's trying to think about the value that you're bringing to your clients and knowing that, yes, they're buying into you as a person as much as the service that you're offering and this element of authenticity really rings true for your question here as well. So do be authentic and trust that people are going to buy into you because of you and your personality. Let's not try to be someone that we're not or try to go too far away from our authentic, genuine selves. So trust that you've got this. Um, I think that's the biggest piece of advice. And also just work, work with other people, have as many conversations as possible about your business to as many people as possible. Because the more that you talk about your business, the more you get used to speaking in front of other people, even if that is just one on one online, maybe there's some networking groups you could go to and practice speaking up in front of those wider groups, because practice really does help in this. The more you do it, especially because this is early days for you as a freelancer, you've nailed your first client that should really give you that boost of confidence and trust that you've got this. Try to get testimonials from your clients as well, I would say, depending on the product or service, if it um, is suitable, because that's gonna really help sort of get people to know who you are um, as a person. But absolutely still be authentic to you, practice as much as possible, talk to as many people as you can about your business and really do get to networking situations where you can as well. Uh, love that question. Um, Edgar from Twitter DM, what are your do's and don'ts when it comes to pitching your business virtually to keep it interactive and engaging. Oh my goodness, how long do we have, Edgar? Do's and don'ts. Uh, I'm gonna try and pick out a few um, for you as well. Okay, so it depends on the length of your pitch. So I work with a lot of entrepreneurs who do uh, startup competitions and they often have three minutes to pitch their business, which isn't a long time, but you can still get a very decent amount into that three minutes. So in that situation, if it's, more sh if it's shorter, then the hook is really key making sure you're hooking your audience in that first sentence that you're saying. So it's not so much wasting time on, hi, this is me, this is my business, I'm gonna to talk to you about X, Y, Z. If it's a short pitch, you get straight to that point and hook them with a fact, a story. Stories always go down really well because people can relate to them, they remember them. It might be a question, a rhetorical question. If it's a longer pitch, then you've got the opportunity to ask questions to to your audience as well. You might still pitch it as a rhetorical question, but that's gonna get them engaged and sitting up and really sort of listening to what you're saying. It, put, it sort of plants food for thought to think, you know, imagine if, have you ever been in this situation? Just to try to plant that seed as well. So questions are great. If you've got the opportunity in your pitch and it is a bit of a longer pitch and you want to invite them to jump into the chat, for example, so you're not losing your flow of the pitch, but you're getting some input from them, great. But more often than not, especially the clients I work with, um, with pitches, it's very much a one-way thing, but you're just trying to keep them engaged as much as possible. So once you've hooked them, you then want to use that non-verbal communication to really keep their attention. If you're using slides, keep them super visual. Don't have too much text on the slides. They're just gonna read that and not listen to what you're saying. It needs to complement. 
So really visual slides. And then also your nonverbal communication, your body language and your voice to keep them engaged and enticed throughout. So hopefully a few things there, but I could talk about do's and don'ts um, for a very long time, but great question, Edgar. Um, Hannah from Instagram DM, uh, do you think it's best to have a virtual background or not? Oh, this is a very interesting question because I'm not a massive fan of virtual backgrounds. However, there is a place for them at certain situations, especially if what's in our background might be might not be necessarily appropriate might not look very professional or you might not just not feel comfortable sharing what's in your background and there are some really great sophisticated backgrounds now that look like you're in an office space which is great um, and again it looks a bit professional and hopefully just make sure that it's not too obvious I mean obviously when we we see people with virtual backgrounds we can kind of tell but we don't want it to be uh, too obvious so i think there's a place if it makes us feel more comfortable and confident just make sure it's a professional looking one if that makes sense avoid the beaches um you know they were funny back in the day in may i've seen ones with sort of crates of beer behind people and it does you know it gets a little laugh but it depends we're talking about pitching our business we want to keep it clean um so yes there is a place for them personally though i would always recommend having a physical background um, as best as possible. I just think it's less distracting. Um, you can play around with sort of what's in the background there as well. So it's, it's not a really direct answer there, but yes, if you're, you feel more comfortable and confident with a virtual background, just make sure it's as professional as possible. But that would be, that's my opinion on that side. Uh, Corinne from Instagram DM. Hi Jenna, some people say that we should develop a persona and behave accordingly while others say be yourself. What would you advise? What a question. And I know I've only got a few minutes left. Okay, so find what works for you. When I work with clients who are really nervous and they've got this fear of public speaking, there is a place to almost embody a super confident version of ourselves. And we do take on that persona just to get through the, the barrier of stepping up to that pitching plate or that presentation plate. However, you still want to be authentic to you as much as possible. So still stick to your genuine self where you can. So that be yourself is absolutely true, but if the nerves are kind of overtaking, then sometimes you do need to think, I'm gonna turn up and be the confident version of me. Super short um, answer there, but hopefully uh, that helps. Okay, so we are now going into the poll results. Thank you so much for engaging with this. We asked you, do you feel confident pitching your business virtually? 67% of you answered yes. Amazing, really great. So, and 33% of you said no. For the 67%, brilliant. We've been in this for close to a year now. So hopefully you're feeling more comfortable and confident online. For the 33%, it's still a daunting prospect. So keep practicing with it as best as possible. So really great answers there and really well done for those that do feel confident and please do keep practicing because this isn't going to go away. There's still going to be a big balance, even though we've got a roadmap now towards in-person meetings, in-person pitches. I still feel like there's going to be a big balance and we're going to be online a lot more than we used to pre-COVID. Uh, so really great there. So keep the practice up. So thank you all for tuning in. My goodness, how quickly has that half an hour gone? If you do have any questions for myself, uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, Jenna Davies. You should be able to find me there. You'll also be able to check out those weekly whiteboard videos uh, that I run. You can also check it out on YouTube. But coming up on Ask the Expert tomorrow is Judith Dugdow, who is Head of Digital Solutions at MHA More and Smalley. The practice is an elite Intuit QuickBooks partner. So please make sure you tune in to get advice on how to prepare your business for post lockdown. That's what everyone's looking at now, now that we've got this bit of a roadmap. So great one to tune into tomorrow at 8.30. Don't forget that you can join the official Intuit QuickBooks SMB group on Facebook and also register for that QuickBooks Connect virtual event on the 3rd of March next week. You can find the link in the comments and so make sure you click on that and connect there as well. It's been an absolute pleasure to answer your questions today. Thank you again for tuning in and I hope you have a brilliant day.